Hey guys, welcome back. So today we are going to freshen up and brighten this grown out bronze balayage. Now her hair was bright red about a year and a half ago. So if you can see a lot of that residual warmth is showing back through. So we wanna remove a lot of that warmth and brighten this to a nice clean bronze color. Now, most of the warmth in this case is actually coming from the dark pieces, if you can see here, and that's because the red is still present underneath of the brown. The blonde pieces will actually brighten up really nicely with just a toner. So as I go through and weave through this, I'm gonna make sure I'm hitting mostly the brown pieces, not the blonde. I'll be starting with Lightener and 25 Volume Developer mixed with Olaplex. And I only mix about 20 grams at a time. When I run out of lightener and need to mix a new bowl, I will bump it up to 30 volume developer with Olaplex. And this just allows for even processing throughout the head so that your last foil processes at about the same speed as the first foil. After this section is weaved, I tease it so that it diffuses the line up top and makes for a softer blend. I found that it's really important to paint the underside of the hair before you put it in the foil just to make sure you're getting full saturation. Full saturation is crucial to a good clean lift. If the hair is not saturated enough, it will not lift very well. Okay, so now I'm just going to go ahead and work my way throughout the back of the head, weaving through every section of hair. In this case, it won't take me quite as long as it normally does because she does have an undercut, which definitely cuts a lot of time off. And I typically like to break the back of the hair up into six different sections. So the nape where her undercut is would be two sections, a left and a right. And then the middle section would be broken into two, a left and a right. And then the top section by the crown, I like to do as one big section. Now, depending on the shape of the head, you may divide this up into three. Sometimes I'll do three triangles, but in this case, you'll see I just do it as one section and take the foil straight across. Something else that I want to point out is that these foils, particularly in the back of the head, are laying on top of each other. And because they're laying on top of each other, they are going to keep heat in a little bit better. Foil keeps heat in similarly to a baked potato. That's why we cover a baked potato in foil so that it keeps the heat in and it cooks and it processes. So for these foils, the foils I'm working on now here are going to be covered with other foils and the heat is going to be kept in really well. But when you get to the top layers, those pieces are not going to be covered with as much foil. So they aren't going to process quite as quickly as these foils are here throughout the majority of the hair. Just be aware of this and you can either saturate those pieces a little bit more, use a higher developer, or even lay a towel on top of the head to keep the heat in. Okay, so moving on to the money piece. Now, I'll often do this differently based on the client's hairline and also how bold of a money piece they're looking for. But for the most part, I typically follow the same pattern where the first section I do is a weave and that really just softens the line at the root. Um, it's gonna be a little bit softer and more blended. And then after that first weave, I'll follow it with two slices. And the slices are back to back and then I will follow them with another weave and then after that, I typically go back to the normal pattern where I'm weaving and teasing the hair. Now, if you'll notice, I am using different foils for the money piece, and this is because I like to use precision foils when I'm detailing around the hairline. The other foils, I don't really consider precision foils, and they're really just to get the bulk of the hair done. These precision foils are made by Fremar and they stay in place a lot better. I just like the feel and the material of them and they hold really well so they're not going to slip which would be very bad if the hair slipped right around the hairline. We do not want any bleed marks right around the face. 
So after the money piece, when you are going to do the sides and the top of the head, there are a number of different ways that you can do this. In this example, I've split the top into two sections. So I'm doing the left side and the right side, and I'm going basically at a diagonal. And the reason for this is just how it's going to lay. I find that you can kind of get away with doing less foils if you do a diagonal, and then you're gonna also have a nice dimensional look without any stripiness. But there are times where I will divide the sides into a section and then the top into a mohawk section. It all depends on what I'm going for, um, how many foils I'm putting in the hair, and really the overall look that I want. For most lived-in colors, I try to do it diagonally like this, but if I'm doing a blonde that is pretty significant and I'm really packing the foils in, then I will split them into smaller, more sections and really pack a lot of foils in and not worry about the dimension as much. And so as I mentioned prior, these top foils may not process quite as quickly as some of those back foils just because there's not as many foils laying on top of them. So sometimes after I finish with the money piece and those sides and I'm working on the top sections, I'll actually bump the developer up 10 instead of five. So if I was at 25, instead of going up to 30 volume, I would go up to 35 volume. So this is really important to kind of think this out before you start the very first foil in the back because you don't want to get to a point where you can't bump up any further. So there are times when clients have a ton of hair where I will start with five or ten volume developer because I know I'm going to be bumping it up so much and when you get to those top pieces you want to make sure that you don't run out of developer. Okay so after the last foil is applied I do not put my clients under the dryer and I instead go back and check the first foil and as you can see here this is why. Unless the hair was all totally virgin, it's not likely ever going to process 100% evenly. And especially since she had red previously on her hair, there's going to be that residual red that's going to show up as we're lightening it, which is why those ends look a little orangey pinkish. So I like to go back and re-hit certain areas with more lightener just so we get even processing all throughout the hair. So the foils at the hairline will always process quite a bit quicker than the rest of the foils throughout the hair. And this is because they are sitting right up against the face. And the face produces heat, which will speed up the processing. Not to mention the fact that these pieces of hair are a lot more fine and often fragile. So they don't take quite as much power to lighten. So once I get to these pieces, I typically remove the foils if they're done processing and I will pull the lightener down. This will stop the processing enough so that the hair doesn't become over processed. And I typically do this all throughout the head. If I ever come across a foil that looks like it's done, then I will remove the foil and then move along so that none of the hair over processes and it all lifts really evenly. And a good rule of thumb to know if the hair is done processing is if it looks like the inside of a banana peel. So if you can see that that hair that I've just pulled down looks like the inside yellow of a banana peel, which is a very pale yellow, then that means that foil is done processing. If it looks more like the outside of a banana peel, then it still needs more processing. So you can either close the foil back up and let it keep processing, or you can reapply more lightener for the last several minutes to speed it up a little bit more. Okay, so now that the blonde is done processing, I've shampooed and conditioned it, as well as combed out all of the teasing. Keep in mind that if you do tease the hair, it's going to take a little bit longer to brush out. So this is why I use conditioner. I know not all stylists use conditioner before they tone, but I like to, and this is just how I do it. 
Okay, so now it's time to apply the root shadow. And the root shadow or root smudge is essentially a darker toner. And this is what is going to allow this color to be a lived in color that is low maintenance. And this will last her months. I have had clients that have gone an entire year without having their hair recolored because the blend is so natural looking. So this is a darker toner that I apply at the root area into where the highlights are. Basically that line of demarcation, that transition area, and this just softens that line for a seamless blend. I never apply the root shadow or the toner at the shampoo bowl just because I like to be really precise with it and section the hair out and apply it like this. Um, I think that it makes a big difference in the quality of the overall color. And as far as the formula goes, I typically like to go slightly lighter than what their natural color is. Um, anything really that's going to blend the dark into the light, you can be completely customizable with this. Um, if they are predominantly blonde, then you may want to go with a much lighter color just to take some of the harshness off. Keep in mind that the closer the color is to the natural color, the more this, this will blend it out and the longer it will last. If they are looking for a much brighter color, especially around their root, then you may want to go not quite as close to their natural color. So her natural color is like a level 4-5. And since we did do so much blonding here, I chose to mix 20 grams of a level 5 and 10 grams of a level 8. So that gives us like a level 6.5-ish. And when you're formulating for your root color, I typically like to mix a natural or a gold color with an ashy color. And this is just what I choose to do. You can go on whatever you choose. I will put the formula that I used on her up on the screen. So when I get to the front, I typically like to pull the sections backwards and work back instead of going up, starting at the top and working my way that way. And this is just to avoid having the hair transfer. If you set the hair that hasn't been colored over hair that has been colored, you can sometimes end up with blotchy marks throughout the blonde pieces. So I like to take vertical sections when I'm working this way. And then I also typically leave the money piece out from the root shadow to begin with. But as you'll see, when I go back and after I apply the toner, I will then normally hit the money piece area with the root shadow right on top of the toner just so this doesn't process quite as long and it stays a little bit more of a softer look rather than a harsh root piece. Okay, so now we're going to go through and apply the toner. And I prefer to apply my toner with a bowl and brush rather than a bottle. Um, I just like to be really precise with it. I know some people will just do this at the shampoo bowl and just shampoo it basically all the way through. Um, to me, that's just kind of messy, and I want to make sure that all the hair gets saturated really well. I also like to often start in areas that may contain more warmth and let those process a little bit longer and then I'll leave the pieces that don't need as much toning out for the end such as the money piece. And when it comes to the toner formula, I honestly really hate sharing my toner formula and the reason for that is because it is such a per case basis. I usually use a different formula for my toner on the same client on each time they come in, it's often different. The toner formula is really based on the lift that you got and what you're trying to correct or enhance. So what I use on this client will likely come out very different on what you use on your client or on your hair. 
but I will put what I used on the screen. I am a big fan of Pravana's Express Tones and their Platinum Tones. I will share what I used just to give you a general idea, but I want to say that it's very important to just learn how to tone properly based on what you're looking to correct and what shade you're looking for. Okay, so I always like to show the color wet before it's dry because it always looks so much darker and it's really hard to actually see the color of the hair when it's wet. So I often have clients ask me at the shampoo bowl how it looks and my response is normally, well, it looks wet. <laughs> so if you can see here, this is what it looks like wet and you'll see it how much it will lighten up once we get it dry. I also want to point out that this is why you should never leave the salon with wet hair because you should always have your color checked dry before you walk out that door. All right, so here we are with the finished result and we were so happy with it. This color is going to blend out beautifully as her hair grows and we got most of that brassiness out to a nice clean neutral blonde.